Have you ever considered how your life is better because of a nonprofit? Research shows that nonprofits are essential to the quality of life in our communities. They provide services to everyone from the most vulnerable to the most resource secure. Some things we take for granted were first introduced by a nonprofit, like the white lines on the side of the road, shown to decrease fatalities and injuries by 37%, saving thousands of lives per year. There are many other white lines that we can thank nonprofits for, like for the programs offered to ensure our youth have quality, productive time while their parents are at work, for the things that make life beautiful art, music, parks, and theater, for the ways they create vibrant, livable communities. An educated workforce, a civically engaged public, and for making sure families have access to services contributing to safe, healthy, and enriched lives. All of these white lines created by nonprofits are like strands woven together that make up our community fabric. The more tightly knit, the better and stronger our community. Let's remember how often we count on nonprofits. Join the Center for Nonprofits in celebrating the vitality of all nonprofits. Helping organizations build a better New Jersey. Good morning. I'm Linda Zippo, President and CEO of the Center for Nonprofits. I'm honored to welcome you to Reckoning, Reshaping, Rebuilding, your 2020 New Jersey Nonprofit Conference. We're grateful to you for taking the time to join us over the next two days. Normally at this time, we'd be gathered together in person in a room buzzing with the energy of hundreds of people representing a wide range of organizations and missions, but sharing the common goals of making our communities and society better. This year, of course, everything is different. We've come together virtually, still several hundred strong, but in the grips of a horrific pandemic. We are grappling with loss of life, economic devastation, deep political and social divisions, and a heightened outcry for equity and racial justice. Throughout this emergency, as in countless other crises, New Jersey's nonprofits have been a lifeline and a backbone, providing life-saving care, food, shelter, mental health counseling, job training, education, forums for artistic and spiritual comfort, healing and inspiration, environmental stewardship, and an outlet for collective action and social change. Simply put, nonprofits show up. And as employers of 10% of the state's private workforce pre-pandemic, and as consumers of goods and services, New Jersey's 34,000 plus nonprofits are vital to the economy. Nonprofits are strong partners in developing short and long-term solutions to address multifaceted problems. Most of us will be more than happy to put 2020 in our rearview mirror, but before we do, let's be clear. We are at a crossroads. Many organizations have been brought to the financial breaking point with an uncertain future in the coming months. The pandemic has laid bare deep inequities and the human and economic toll of years of underinvestment in critical systems and needs, including nonprofits and the people and communities they serve, and particularly marginalized communities and people of color. Our social and democratic norms and basic principles of humanity are being sorely tested. As nonprofits, our entire reason for being is to make society better by our missions and deeds. We must recommit ourselves to ensuring that we are living up to that promise through our direct programs and operations, through advocacy and systems change, by advancing an equitable society and actively working against systemic racism and injustice. Over the next two days, we'll have a chance to explore many of the issues, challenges, and yes, the opportunities before us as individuals, as nonprofits, and as a society. We are grateful that you've chosen to invest your time with us. We know that devoting large swaths of time to any conference can be challenging, let alone at a virtual event and with so many urgent competing needs. We are recording all of the sessions, but we urge you to be present in the event as much as possible. Connect with colleagues in the app, in the chat, and in the breakout rooms. Watch for and act on time-sensitive calls to action on specific advocacy initiatives. Enjoy and be inspired by individuals who share your passion for making the world better. Share with, lean on, celebrate, and learn from each other. We have many, many people to thank for making this conference possible, and we'll be doing that through the app and in real time over the next two days. Tremendous challenges lie ahead, but we have an opportunity to regroup and reimagine how we work together to make tomorrow better for everyone. I'm looking forward to learning from and with you. Let's get started.
Hey everybody, Governor Phil Murphy here. Although it would have been my honor to attend this year's Center for Nonprofits conference in person to thank each and every one of you for the extraordinary work you have done this year, I am relieved you are playing it safe and staying virtual. Words cannot express the measure of gratitude New Jersey has for your organizations, your workers, and your volunteers. In a normal year, you go above and beyond to strengthen our social safety net, making sure countless families have what they need when they fall on hard times, for instance. This year, the hard times have come to an overwhelming number of New Jerseyans in both our health and in our economy. Many of those struggling, I am sure, include members of your own organizations who continue to serve their communities despite enormous personal difficulties. And you have sustained this level of support as raising funds has become harder than ever, essentially doing more, but with less. There are so many things our state has to thank you for. Your time, your talent, and your resources, your empathy and compassion, the personal risk many of you have taken to continue serving those in need. But more than anything, I want to thank you for the example you have set for the rest of our entire state. New Jersey has been hit hard by COVID-19. There is no denying that and there's no denying we're still in it. And there's also no de denying that this year has been a year filled with uncertainty, anxiety, and fear. But where some responded this, to this crisis by hoarding, you have sought to share. And although your generosity can be measured by the amount of resources you have distributed, the benefit to the state by your generosity of spirit remains immeasurable. Our straight is, state is stronger because of individuals like you who in the middle of a crisis look to see who needs help. I wish I could say that we were at the end of this pandemic, but we are not there yet. As we continue to fight our way through, I'm grateful to count you, all of you, as our partners, and our administration will do all we can to support your efforts. It has been a long, difficult, and isolating year. Our communities are not surprisingly becoming fatigued. But together and with your example, I know we can inspire continued cooperation and concern for others and ultimately save lives. So on behalf of the First Lady, the Lieutenant Governor, and myself, thank you all so much again for all that you do and best wishes for a successful conference. God bless each and every one of you. Our thanks to Governor Murphy for sharing his message of support to nonprofits and to his administration and our government officials for their leadership during this very critical time. It's now my pleasure to share a welcome message from our lead sponsor, PSEG, and Calvin Ledford, president of the PSEG Foundation. Hello, and welcome to the Center for Nonprofits of New Jersey's virtual conference. My name is Calvin Ledford. I am the president of the PSEG Foundation, director of corporate social responsibility at PSEG. PSEG is pleased to once again sponsor this important philanthropic gathering of leaders to address issues facing the nonprofit community. The PSEG Foundation's role is to help build sustainable and thriving communities through fostering safety, equity, diversity and inclusion, as well as supporting the environment through education and workforce development programs. You know, it goes without saying that we experienced an entirely new reality in 2020. And that's the reason we can't be together in person. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated communities from both a health and financial standpoint. The nonprofit sector has been especially hit as well. The PSCG Foundation recognized the impact of the coronavirus has had on our community which is why this past spring, the foundation announced a $2.5 million commitment as a philanthropic response to the pandemic. 
This includes a signature grant to the New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund, targeted support such as local food banks, PPE to medical organizations, grassroots support at the local level via an RFP process. I, well actually we, look forward to the continued partnership with the center as we navigate this challenge together. Thank you and enjoy the conference. And many, many thanks to PSEG, uh, to Calvin Ledford, to the entire team at PSEG. Uh, PSEG has long been a corporate and philanthropic leader in the state for so many years, and we're grateful to them for everything they've done during the pandemic and indeed for so many years for communities throughout the state and for the nonprofit community, including the Center for Nonprofits. I'm going to run through a little bit of housekeeping uh, and a little bit of an overview for the next two days before we dive in and uh, introduce our keynote speaker. If you have not downloaded the Whova app, um, it's a great way to be connected to your colleagues through the, through the conference, um, make new connections. You'll find access to breakout materials, interesting articles. All of our exhibitors are there. There are giveaways and offers. You do not want to miss the app. So uh, find, if you haven't downloaded it, you can get it through your smartphone's app store. And the code to use to access the center's conference is NJNPC2020. And that will also be in the chat. So for today, we are at day one. Welcome to day one. Um, we are in the first portion of the session, of course. Um, we are. Uh, we thank our exhibitors for making themselves available early to introduce themselves to many of you. Again, please take the time to visit them. They have a lot of great offerings that you'll be interested in. Um, we'll be uh, introducing David Camp very shortly. Uh, we'll then have a break. It'll be an opportunity for you to stretch or visit each other with the app. Um, we will break for lunch at for lunchtime networking and discussion. There will be. Uh, breakout groups that you can get into, including one specifically dedicated for nonprofit professionals of color. That is going to be led by Victoria Fernandez um, and Tanisha Gibbs and uh, their colleagues at the Rutgers Institute for Ethical Leadership and the nonprofit uh, professionals of color collaborative. Um, so if you are interested in that breakout room, there will be information about that. And then for uh, there will be other breakouts at lunch to just talk about other issues that are interesting to you. At 1.15, there will be another opportunity to ask the exhibitors about their offerings or ask them questions about their areas of expertise. And then at two o'clock, we will go into our first breakout session, uh, first set segment of six. And again, the link that I provided earlier will give you the uh, information about how to access each of those breakout rooms. And finally, we will cap off the day at 3.30 with a networking and trivia session. You won't wanna miss this. It's a nice way to unwind and there will be prizes. So make sure that you uh, show up for that as well. Tomorrow we'll regroup at 8.30. It'll be a chance to meet the staff and uh, talk to our wonderful team about the Center for Nonprofits and our services. We'll regroup at 9 o'clock and just re-engage before we break out into our two uh, final sets of breakout sessions. Again, there will be breaks, plenty of opportunities for you to refresh and convene, um, lunchtime discussions again, and we will cap off the day, the conference with a really important plenary panel focused on how philanthropy and nonprofits can advance equity and anti-racism. And we are thrilled and honored that uh, our keynote speaker, David Kant, will also be moderating that session. Uh, so you won't want to miss that either. So we hope that you will be with us in person in real time for as much of this period as you can. Uh, but we are recording things, so you'll be able to revisit things or revisit the sessions that you weren't able to attend personally. It is now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. David Kemp, founder of The Dialogue Company. 
David grew up in Detroit, the only child in his family. After graduating from high school, David attended Princeton University, where he earned his undergraduate degree in computer science. He then studied city planning at the University of California, Berkeley. And after completing his doctoral degree with a dissertation on the cultural effects of urban planning, he went to work for the Clinton administration's Conversation on Race Initiative. Throughout the course of his 25 year career as a featured presenter, he has helped groups focus on a variety of topics, including strategic planning, conflict re resolution, creating more inclusive decision making, leadership succession, um, cultural competence, and many others. His clients have included the US military, the White House, large corporations, national and international organizations, foundations, government, nonprofits, and, and more. David is considered a national expert in the areas of inclusion and equity, stakeholder engagement, and conflict resolution and dialogue. He has appeared on national media outlets as well as local television, radio, and print media across the United States. And as I mentioned, in addition to presenting this morning's keynote, he will also be moderating tomorrow's closing uh, plenary panel on how philanthropy and nonprofits can advance and equity and anti-racism. And David, before I turn things over to you, I just wanted you to know that Sharnita Johnson of the Dodge Foundation, who connected us, um, was any, unable to introduce you today, but she said she wanted to make sure I mentioned your shared Motown connection, and I quote, Detroit, not Morristown. So David, we are thrilled that you can join us, and I encourage you to please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Linda. So first of all, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, so I'm grateful to be here. It's a great opportunity for me because I get to do two of my favorite things. And one of them is talking to people about how people talk to each other. I am very intrigued by that and the question of how we can have better conversation to make better decisions. I'm so in a dialogue. I might be something of a enthusiast of interlocution, maybe a connoisseur of confabulation, maybe a cognoscenti of colloquy, a devotee of discussion, a professor of parley, a doyen of discourse. That's what I aspire to be. The, but the most important thing is that I am a dialogaholic. Excuse me for a second. I am addicted to thinking about how people talk better so they can do better. So that's one of my big interests. The other one is the issue of racial equity. So let me tell you a little bit about how those interests got started. So when I was about nine years old, there was a night, one night when I woke up middle of the night, went to the bathroom, I noticed that my mom was out of the living room and she was, she was on the couch. So I went over to her and noticed that she was crying. Like, mama, why are you crying? Oh, nothing. Not really, why are you crying, mama? So I'm old enough to think I could really be helpful, nine years old. And she said, well, I just, I, sometimes, I don't like the way my, your, your father talks to me. It seems so harsh. It seems so unnecessary. I, of course, had also thought that the way they talked to each other was kind of uh, unnecessarily difficult and unpleasant. I was like, well, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can get him to talk to you better. I've tried. I've tried. So I'm, I'm, I'm just worried it'll never get any better. So then I was like, well, maybe we should get a divorce. So looked at me kind of strange and said, uh, no, it's not worth that. I just wish we could talk better. So I think that, at that was a moment in which I was intrigued at the idea that people can talk better and be happier and do better together. Excuse me, David. Uh-huh. Um, we can't see you. Can you check your, oh, there you are. Okay, thank ah. you. So, so if that happens again, let me know immediately. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So thanks for that. Okay, so 
my interest in issues of racial equity was sparked around the same time. I had a fourth grade social studies teacher, Mr. Nathan Fine, who I recently discovered is actually still alive at 87. And Mr. Nathan Fine, as a social studies teacher, he was teaching us to about all the cultures around the world in various places far from Detroit. And he would have us do projects on it as a social studies teacher would, but he would always have a savvy day. You know, people are more alike than they are different. And we would have, a, he'd have us say that. People are more alike than they are different. Now, I think that what he was doing was trying to be a force against what we were seeing outside of us. It was the early seventies. We were, uh, we had just had our first black mayor. That was a big controversy. As you can imagine Coleman Young. Uh, there was a case around the same time around forced busing where a whole bunch of white folks and a whole bunch of black folks were at each other's throats and often conflicting uh, at rallies in the streets, not unlike we've seen uh, recently, but even more conflictual than that. And so I became intrigued by the question of to what extent are people similar or different and what difference does that make? And how do we arrange ourselves so that we can discover whatever kind of commonality we have, as Mr. Fine said, and make good decisions about how institutions should function. So, um, so I became intrigued by that. So the, today is a great day for me because whenever I can talk about both dialogue, how people can talk better, and issue of racial equity, it's a great day for me. So I'm happy to be having a chance to talk to you. Now, you folks are here because you have some level of interest or maybe a great level of interest in addressing racial equity gaps in the nonprofit sector. Uh, they are many. I'll just mention a few just to get us all grounded. People of color represent 20%, 30, about 30% of the US workforce about 18% of nonprofit staff nationwide, 22% uh, of foundation staff are people of color. When you look at people of color's uh, role in nonprofits, there's a gap between, let's say just say black and white for the sake of this conversation. 72% uh, of leaders of color had board members who did not, who did not raise money. 64% of white leaders had that. 63% of leaders of color reported they lack access to individual donors. 49% of white leaders say that. 51% of leaders lack access to foundations uh, versus 41% of white leaders saying that. So not only are we, are black people, and I, I, my suspicion is, is that that would be true for certainly Hispanics uh, too, is that there's a gap in our participation level. The, and there's also a gap in our access level, both uh, diversity is a problem and full inclusion is a problem. Y'all are here to address that. Last one I'll say, I think we can stipulate this point. Last one I'll say is just that a study by the Green Lightning Institute found that less than 5% of all charitable donations are going to communities of color. So I think we can just stipulate this is an issue. That's why y'all here. So we, we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. The question is how do we talk about that in a way that is most productive. So I think of, of course, within this sector and within society generally, things shifted over the summer, the George Floyd murder that we all witnessed, the horrible, brutal snuffing out of a human life, we all witnessed that. And I think that catalyzed something in the nation as we, we see 26 million people were involved in protests, 93% of which were peaceful, by the way. And what that murder, of course, did was to remind us all that there's a legacy of hatred that is still in our country. And that's important to think about. But I, but I think it went further than that, why people were catalyzed so much. We were reminded of this legacy. And we were reminded of the fact that all these disparities we see across in the corporate sector, in terms of incarceration, I don't need to go down the list, is probably linked in ways that some of us are better at explaining than others, linked to that legacy of hatred that we all know about. 
So I think it's important not to forget that. But I would submit to you that while we need to remember that hatred is a part of what's happening, we also need to remember that part of what's going on and has always been going on is something closer to indifference. Indifference to human pain, indifference to other people's experience. That is, in, that is linked to that. I think that the hatred that some people feel is related to indifference, but there's also indifference that's not related to hatred. There's indifference that people feel that is not, that, that they, they don't feel hatred of other people, they're just indifferent to their plight, to their circumstance, to their collective future. And I think this slight distinction is important to bring up as, you're, as we're trying to get people more on board with the notion of equity, with the idea that we have to do things for equity. I think that one problem that we can cause ourselves is to frame it too much around hatred because that's not going on for many people who are in fact simply indifferent. In a society that is gonna work well for everybody, in a society that there's compassion for everybody, in a society in which all people are actually regarded as equal, not just under the law, but by society, that indifference matters. So that's a slight reframe. We will talk about other reframes as I go forward. Okay. So what I think is important to just lift up and get clear on, if we're thinking about how to talk to other people about this issue, how to increase the momentum around racial equity, thinking about how we talk about it is important. So I just gave you one suggestion to, to, to think about whether we're labeling it in um, hatred too frequently and not frequently enough in difference. So that's one frame to just, let's, let's hold that for a moment. Now, if we go back to the, not how the nonprofit sector works, uh, one thing that I wanna invite us to do, if we've shifted from thinking about hatred to indifference, is to talk about the possibility that the gaps we see are a function of altered, distorted decision-making at various points in the nonprofit industrial complex pipeline. Decisions about where and with whom to network, decisions about who to recruit, decisions about who to hire, decisions about rewards and bonuses, about promotions, about grant making, about who is our vendor. Those are all discretionary decisions that can be distorted by something that goes right along with indifference. And that's the issue of unconscious bias. And so one of my main points I want to say today is that I think if we're going to advance the ball on racial equity, we all need to become a little bit fluent in talking about unconscious bias. And I'll talk about this all the time, I give presentations about it, you know, that's, that's my lane. Everybody don't need to do all of that. But I do think that it is valuable for everybody to become a little more fluent in talking about unconscious bias and to frame the problems that we have around equity as related to the way that unconscious bias affects that pipeline, affects different decisions in that pipeline. I think that that is a more helpful frame in terms of persuading people and getting them on board. Now, let me tell you why I think it's a better frame. And I'll do a little bit of context on this. My sense is that the racial divide in this country is really not a of color white divide, it's really a mindset divide. And the divide is about the degree to, um, is about whether you, how you answer the following question. One of the questions is, what is the degree to which you can be racist or racially problematic or perpetuate racism without intending to? That's the unconscious bias question. Another one is, what is the degree to which the structures of the past that we all know about, Jim Crow, redlining, slavery, et cetera, to what extent are those affecting us now? And then the third question is a corollary of the first two questions, which is, if either of the first two questions have an answer, yes, those things matter, are there any moral implications of that? 
So I suspect that something on the order of 100% of the people watching this, watching me right now, would say the answer is yes, you can be, uh, you can perpetuate racism or be biased without intending to. Yes, this, the past matters to our current arrangements. And yes, there's more cases of that for individuals in society. But the fact of the matter is there are a whole bunch of people who don't say yes, yes, yes. There are people who say no, no, no. Some of those people might, some of those people are on boards of important companies in this country. Some of those people have high offices in this country. There are people who say yes, yes, no, or some combination of that. Yeah, the, the, maybe you can be, um, maybe you can be uh, uh, racially problematic without intending to, and you know, maybe yeah, the past matters. But hey, that was a long time ago, and you cause more problems by actually trying to do something about that. So no, there's no moral implications of that. There's also some answers to those questions. I think that divide, the divide around equity in this country, is really about those three questions. Now, I think historically, what we've done is we try to make arguments for racial equity. What we've done is we've gone to the third question, isn't it obvious that there's more obligation given the past history? Or we've gone to the second question, it's clear that the structures of the past matter. We haven't spent as much time on the first question. And that's what I think is the shift that we all need to be starting to make as we try to increase the prominence and the effectiveness of the racial equity movement. We need to spend a little bit more conversational energy on that biased question. There are some reasons for that. One of the reasons is that the bias frame, as we try to figure out why racism exists, why disparities exist, the bias frame is more inclusive in a couple different ways. One is that if we think about unconscious bias as a distortion of how people relate to each other, everybody's subject to it. There's racial bias, there's gender bias, there's bias on the basis of attractiveness, weight, orientation, religion, you name it. Everybody is subject to some type of bias. When I do trainings, I often try to get people to look at various parts of our identity and then talk about have they ever experienced bias. A huge percentage of people will tell you they've experienced some type of bias. So on, on one hand, that frame is a more inclusive frame. Everybody has been a victim of that in some way, or virtually everybody. But the other way it's more inclusive is that everybody can manifest it. So we all become somewhat accountable if we start talking about it. I, I, wasn't, I, I, was, I never owned no slaves. We've all heard that. I wasn't involved in creating those structures. That's not my responsibility. What, and the world have an obligation about that. But reframing some of our equity problems as a function of bias that's pervasive and making that as an argument, would it also suggest, and remember, everybody can be subject to subject, a victim of bias, everybody can be potentially a perpetrator of bias. So that shift in how we talk about it, I think is more inviting. Along with that, it focuses on responsibility. It focuses on what, what can we do to fix the problem? What can we do to create a society in which bias is less of a factor? Because it's a factor for affecting everybody. It focuses on responsibility. And very importantly, it's less focused on shame. Now, do I think America needs to uh, be co collectively be ashamed of what's happened? Of course, of course, that's true. But from a standpoint of trying to persuade people to get on board, I think most teachers and coaches would tell you that it's easy to get into the level of shame that shuts down both learning and transformation. So the bias frame is a more effective frame because it is not, it need not be grounded in shame. I think that the fact that there's so much shame about racism is probably a good thing. Um, the, the, Linguist John McWhorter, he says that there's the, the three worst things in American society in order are a murderer, you can be a murderer, that's really, really bad. You can be a child molester, that's really, really bad. You can be a racist, that's also really bad. And so of course, he's a, he's a kind of, a, he leans a black conservative. He, uh, not, not as doctrinaire as others though, but um, he 
of, of not surprisingly believes that sometimes the racist um, attribution is overused. We can talk about that. But the point is being racist really, really bad. We positioned it like that. We positioned being subject to manifesting racial bias. We positioned it as a social faux pas on the order of a capital crime. That made sense given given the civil rights movement and given the hundreds of years of collective crime, both collective and interpersonal crime that has taken place, it makes sense that we position a culture like that. But if we're going to move forward, I think we need to, on some level, downgrade the significance morally. We need to make it less of a capital crime, more of a third degree misdemeanor so that we can stop being in denial about it. So that we can start owning the fact that we're all subject to it, hashtag, we all have the virus, right? So I want to suggest that as we're trying to grow the racial equity movement, we all need to become a little bit more fluent in talking about bias and framing the challenge around bias. Does that mean we need to completely forget structural analysis? No. Does that mean we need to completely forget the notion of a moral imperative? No. But what I'm saying is, is that when you're talking to people who are not on board with any of that, I want to invite you to consider whether a frame around bias, we're facing these disparities because of a pervasiveness of bias that happens to cut a particular way, but bias is a general problem that affects a lot of people, but it cuts a particular way, producing a particular result. I think that's a better frame. And so what I'm inviting you to consider is that reframe. And what I'm going to be talking about is some things that you can do. Once you establish that frame, there's, a, there's some specific things you can do to make you even more effective in inviting people to accept that frame and to get them on board with the idea that racial bias, unconstitutional bias is a problem and, it is, and therefore it is linked to these other problems that we're talking about. Okay. If we're gonna talk about bias, here's what I do. Again, I'm a, I do this all the time and I'm up in front of people for a long time. And I'm not saying you need to know all, you need to, you need to read all the books about that. But I am saying that it's important to know a little bit about that because it, it gives people an on-ramp to understanding it. So one of the first places in the on-ramp is to, to understand essentially the bias we have against other people as groups is a version of a cognition problem that we have that we're subject to having about things that are not groups, not, group, not, not people. So um, I think it's useful to have one or two examples of that. I'm gonna give you all about five in just a minute. But the, the, the point is, is that having just a, one or two examples of the way that our minds work in mysterious ways, we're not always in control of what we're thinking is a very useful thing to try to put people on the on-ramp to understand, to accepting that bias is a problem. Let me give you all a few examples. I'll just do this. Each one of these I could tell in three minutes, but we, I got other things to get to, so I'm gonna tell them really quickly. So one of them, one of the, uh, one of the experiments, uh, one of the I most love is, um, goes like this. People come to the experimental site and uh, their job is to uh, read a paragraph, answer some questions, go down the hall, do a physical task. And what the experiments are actually testing is whether what you read affects how long you walk down the hall. So in one, in the control group, it's a, a, a regular words, no particular, uh, uh, no particular um, uh, uh, cast or connotation of the words, but in, uh, in the con experimental condition, the, the, the paragraph has words like Florida, wrinkles, gray weather, connoting old. And what happens? People walk down the hall more slowly. So just by reading a paragraph that has words that connote old in it, old and early, not in the paragraph, people, uh, they act in a way that they will be associated with being older. Second example. Um, the experiment goes where you go, you're going to uh, read a job description and a potential job applicant, you rate the job applicant, th th their appropriateness for that job. So what happens when you go to the test room, there's two conditions. You go, you go into the third floor and the, as, as they press the button to go up, the, the assistant who's taking you to the room, they hand you their coffee to hold so they can, they can uh, press the elevator. In 
half of the time the coffee is iced coffee, half the time coffee is warm coffee. If pe people hold the warm coffee, rate the, rate the job applicant as warmer, more intelligent and better suited for the job, more likely to be successful. We confuse the warmth of the coffee with the warmth of the person. Give you another example that's less of, a, less of an experiment and more of a finding. Six, uh, 3,000 uh, applications to the University of Toronto Med Medical School were studied, were examined for what are the factors that make a difference on admission. If your application was discussed by the committee on the day that it was raining, you had a 10% less chance of getting accepted than it was discussed on the day that it was sunny. In all these experiments, nobody would think they're affected by something as irrelevant to the task at hand as the things that were actually relevant to the that affected their behavior. Give another example. This test was done in England. So they had a, a knowledge test of just sort of basic factual, factual knowledge that most adults should know. Before the people took the test, in one condition, they read about college professors. And the other one, they read about hooligans, ne'er-do-wells, people who are out in the street causing problems. They do worse on the test when they're reading about the hooligans. They, 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 so there's some sort of association that happens that we're not aware of when people do worse on the test. I'll tell you one more that I find, I find just particularly interesting. So <clears throat> in this test, they, on this experiment, they have people uh, write down the last two digits of their social security number. So they're writing down, you know, 77 or 13 or whatever it is. And then they put that, put that away and then they bid on an item. So it was first done like back when there were Walkman, right? And it was done uh, several times. And what they find is there's a big gap between the bids on the item on average between people who, who have a number that's above 65, last two digits, and a number that's below 35. So basically at the outer edges of that, it affects how you think about your bid for this item. Basically we're grounded it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a um, last number bias, essentially. So we're, that higher number makes us bid more, okay? Now, you don't need to know all of those. There's many more of those. You can, you, can, you can find them all around. But the point is, is that each of those experiments evidences the fact that our minds are a mystery, that we don't know what we, we don't know everything about how we're thinking. And I have found that presenting those is intriguing to people. Because we know our minds are a mystery and we have a sense that we're not on top of it, but we, we like to think we are. So hearing about the fact that we're not affected by that is it kind of intrigues people and it paves the way for a conversation about bias between people because it's a reflection of the cognitive bias we have as a general matter. So you shift people's op opinion after you lay out one of those just to, you know, and there are numerous examples of that. You know, I, another example is not an experiment. You know, <laughs> I bet some of y'all Whole food shoppers, well, you know, they often use wooden crates in Whole Foods. It's not because wooden crates hold stuff better, it's because you, you are more likely to think this food came right off the truck if it's in a wooden crate, no matter what kind of crate it actually was carted in. If it's presented to you in a wooden crate, you are more likely to think it's fresh and something you want to pay the top dollar for, okay? So, so my point is that <clears throat> an on-ramp, to a discussion of bias, that's its own difficulty, but less difficult than the other things I talked about, structural issues and moral obligation issues. And on ramp to even that discussion is the problem of, is the issue of cognitive priming and the, the, the way that our minds work that we're not completely on top of. Okay, so as you're trying to move somebody along from the path of, from the stance of resistance, and I, I know, and I know that resistance is, is a big factor, even in the nonprofit sector. I suspect that a lot of y'all have uh, staff who are not as on board with the racial equity movement as you would like, or board members, or funders, or community members. So my point is that your ability to persuade people to invite people to new thinking is important. And I'm suggesting that um, this is a way of doing that. So if you've gotten them on the cognitive priming train, the, the, the baby step, then you can also 
just bring out a couple of examples of what we know from science about bias, bias against people. I'll give you all a few examples that people tend to resonate with. One example is from um, the classical music domain. So in the uh, 80s, late 70s, 80s, early 90s, there was a recognition that uh, our symphonies, our prestigious symphonies were, uh, had um, less females than were people graduating from the prestigious music, um, music schools. So people said, well, let's say what we can do about that. Maybe gender bias is going on. So people began to experiment with, you have people come out to the audition behind a curtain, so you can't see them. And when you do that, you get a slight bump up in the number of women who are selected. Then people realize, you know, women's footfalls are different than men's footfalls. So when you have people come out in stocking feet or you put a carpet out, the number of women who get selected goes way up. Now, these are, this is not the KKK symphony. This is, these are people who want the best symphony possible, but they're still affected by that bias against women, including women on these committees. Another example of that, there's, there's a, a big resume study was done uh, with people who run big science lab. Like they hire, they got a staff of 33 to 20, 20 people. So, so large science labs. And uh, they send people uh, one resume and you it's 1,200 people, you divide the group up and half of them get a resume from John Smith, half of them from Jennifer Smith, same exact resume. The average rating of Jennifer uh, is um, a competence level was 3.3 as opposed to John 4.0 and also difference in salary, expected salary, 15% difference on that too. This also was reflected in the assessment of the 400 women of the, of the 1200s, 400 uh, female principal investigators and 800 men, say no difference in between them. So part of what's important to do if you're trying to get people on board with the bias thing is to not make it about animus. It's not about hating certain groups. It's not about disliking groups. It's a bigger thing. And you're, it's important that you find a way to talk about that and to invite people to that newer understanding. The, again, the bias literature is filled with these experiments. You don't have to know a lot of them. Some of them are kind of funny. Like, so, so one of them, they, um, they, uh, show people like a video uh, and they have like a, they have like a, a, a gun, a, 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 a toy gun, like a laser gun. And what they're supposed to do is to look at the person, look at the entity that is threatening them and to as quick as they can discern whether they're holding a gun or some other object and shoot them if they're holding a gun and don't shoot them if they're not. And of course they're looking at how, how quickly you shoot and how accurately you make the right choice. And as you could, as you might expect, uh, for um, civilians, it's a little, it's a little, at least a little bit better than civilian. Um, people shoot more quickly if the person is black, um, and they're more likely to make a mistake. If they have a gun, they shoot more quickly. And if they don't have a gun, they're more likely to make a mistake. They think they have a gun when they don't have it. This is even true when it's robots. When the, when the, when it comes out, it's a, is a, is a black robot versus a white robot. It's the, still the same effect. There's something that shows you how deep the bias is. That that even something that is not that is clearly not human, but is either dark complected, complected or lighter, it still it uh, produces the same response. Where we more quickly uh, attack the black one and make more mistakes on that. I find that kind of just inherently it's tragic, but also amusing. Poor dark robot. So, but this, this issue around the, the pervasive unconscious bias, you see it all over society. So uh, another experiment, um, uh, they give briefs from young lawyers to law partners and they have them read over the briefs for mistakes, errors, especially typos. And what they find is that if the person has a name that's a black sounding name, you're more, you're, you're likely to find more errors. I think in the in one study that they put nine errors in the document, and on average, for the white sounding name, the people found like four and a half, and for the black sounding name, they found like seven and a half. So the people still miss some, but there was a big gap in that just on having a black sounding name. You see 
there's bias experiments that show that, um, a, a example, when, when um, teachers are watching children, people say, okay, we're looking for the problematic behavior. You got, two, you got a black boy, black girl, white boy, black girl, they're all playing together. And the teachers are told to look for any signs of behavior difficulties and then, and then make a report on that uh, to, to um, fill out a form claiming who was, what was the problem, what was the severity of the problem, who had it, et cetera. There was no actual problem. There was no actual discipline or behavior problem. But in a huge portion of cases, like 42%, the teachers found that the black boy's behavior was problematic. In fact, they, in this experiment, when they watch the video, they are tracking people's eyes and they can see that, in fact, the teachers are watching the black boy a little more closely, right? These, again, these are, these are grade school teachers. So these are people who are not hateful of kids. So it isn't about intention. That's important. Last one I'll mention, just as an example. So in one experiment they did, first they started at UCLA Medical School and they, uh, they looked at people who came in with femur fractures, biggest bone in the body. And they looked at what's the degree to which, uh, the, the frequency of which people receive analgesics while they're waiting to get the cast and get treated. And they found that about 75% of the white folks got painkillers and about 50% of the Latinos. Okay, and this is, again, this is not the, this is not the Nazi hospital. This is UCLA Medical School, right? Uh, and none of the doctors would claim to have been affected by something as irrelevant as the ethnicity of the person. They do the experiment, same experiment seven years later, Emory, same result. About 50, 75% of the white folks get the painkillers, 50% of the black folks, right? So here's what's important to be able to do. It's important to just have a couple of these that you know about and to frame it up as it isn't about hatred. It's about like a cognitive glitch. It's a, it's a, a glitch that we have in our minds that we're sometimes subject to. And anybody can be subject to it. It's important to take this thing out of it and, and, but to invite people to understand it as a human problem, a cognitive problem, and less about a moral problem. So I want to spend the rest of my time talking about not, not a knowledge, but skills, storytelling skills, which require different levels of courage. But first I want to tell you a story that has to do with courage. So as was mentioned in my introduction, I used to work for the White House. I worked for the President's Initiative on Race. And uh, so the idea was to have a big national effort to, to have dialogue about racial issues. They hired exactly one person who didn't think about dialogue, <laughs> even though they had 40 staff. So that just shows you how dialogue gets short shrift. So as a dialogue person, I had a primary responsibility for organizing the president's national town hall meeting. The first one, first one we did, we were thinking about doing several of these. We went to the first one, Akron, Ohio. So how do you have a, how do, how do you arrange that? So I came up with the following format. So the president would be out there, he'd be kind of like the main um, uh, facilitator, although he's in the conversation, that's his own uh, uh, tensions around that role. So you first start with three people, it was like a, a, a famous conservative author and a, a black a white woman, a black, a, a, black, a black woman and this young white guy. So he, he talked to them for a little while, almost like in a fishbowl, but then behind them are 60 people um, all, all from various backgrounds all over Akron. So my job was to, was to constitute that audience. And then of course there's hundreds of people in the actual audience. So my job was to like, what's the diversity mix in both in philosophy and, and gender and race and all that. So I organized people to get that. You can't always get every person, but you know, we come up with a decent mix of people that I thought would potentially make for a good conversation. So the president was gonna be running this, but then there's this other guy who's kind of his co-facilitator, he's kind of in the background because President Clinton likes to think of himself as like Mr. Facilitator. Okay, he was pretty good at it. So but there's this other dude who had like the, the chart of all these people um, and who, who sometimes intervene and say, why don't you go to this person? Why don't you go to this person next? So they were kind of co-doing it. So, um, so it was me, I led the team of people putting those people in there. So we're in a meeting. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on this. This is the first time on meeting, the, the, the initiative is early. We want to have a great success. So, uh, we have a, a staff meeting two days before it's going to happen where we're talking about how it's going to work. So the facilitator is there. 
uh, and the rest of the team is there. And we're talking about just how it's going to work and what's the, what's the order of sequence. And so the facilitator asked a question. Uh, so is anybody going to be talking to me in my ear about this? So the main lead on this project was this woman named, uh, named Grace, who everybody at the initiative didn't like. She was kind of super silly. She was kind of, uh, she was kind of sending. She was, she was on the advanced team. Uh, and she had been at experience of people who are doing advanced with president is the most prestigious job in the world. So she kind of looked down on us and was, she was kind of ab abrasive. And so, so he asked that question and then, and sort of eyes shifted some to me and some to Grace about what, what he, whether, whether there was gonna be anybody in his ear giving him any kind of guidance, whether he just was gonna look at his sheet and, uh, and make a, and make the calls on who to go to next. So that, that, so that moment happened. I'll tell you what happened at that at, at, later in, in my talk. I'll tell you what happened at that moment. It was a moment that required some courage. I'll tell you what happened. But let me tell you about, I'm gonna leave that and come back to another moment that required a little bit of courage. It's a personal story from, from um, my experience. So before um, I went to Princeton, I was, you know, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship from Bell Laboratories that was existed. And I had a full ride to Princeton. And so I moved to New Jersey, to Scataway, New Jersey, actually. Um, and, um, you know, I had this little, some little job that is appropriately difficult for somebody with, who is gonna be a computer science major with at one computer science class uh, in high school. And I'm old enough where we use paper tape for that class. So for those of y'all over over 50, y'all might remember the paper tape days. So um, so I have this I have this job, and part of part of what they're trying to do is just it's a affirmative action effort, right? And so uh, part of what happens is is that you get to have lunch with like the this VP, this like my boss's boss's boss, like way up the chain. Now this dude was known for being like gruff, and and, and like even though he did these lunches, like it's like. I was told this guy doesn't like doesn't like this that much, but he's he's nice enough. But don't be he's not Mr. Woman Fuzzy. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, that's interesting. I never met somebody that high in the company. What does he do? They like, well, he like he manages the company. He makes sure that the division is working on time. Okay, what does he do? Well, you know that's what he does. So I couldn't get an answer to that question. So we have a lunch. It's gonna be a short lunch. And so he's asking me a few questions, and there's a silence. And I so so Mr. I don't remember his name now. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bossman basically. So what do you actually do? And then he gives me a standard answer. Well, you know, I run the division and I make sure that the division is uh, operating in accord with the company, what the company does, et cetera. I said, okay, well, I, that's, that's great. But what do you actually do? And I kind of leaned in to ask that. And he like stopped for a second. And he said, nobody ever asked me that. But what I actually do is do a lot of BS. And then he proceeded to talk about like the, uh, the ego conflicts that happened both below him and at his level and the way he has to kind of lock, keep people in line so that they don't make decisions that are uh, selfish and not only about the company's benefit. And he, he kind of went on and on and talked about that. And, and then at the end, he said, um, you know, nobody ever asked me that. You keep asking questions, young man. And, so, and then for the rest of the summer, when I see him, not very often because he's a big muggity muck, you know, he see, there's the question guy, keep asking questions. Like he, would, he, would, he really, it really struck him. And I even heard from my boss how that was really, uh, it really struck him. He, he heard down the chain that, the, how how that question was um, shifted him, shifted him, shifted that moment. The point of me telling you that is that I think part of what is important to do is to start asking hard and potentially courageous questions about equity. We need to start asking hard questions some, some easy questions like, do we have data or metrics? How come we don't have that? Could we get that? But I think that the hard, there's, there's questions at that level that I think we sometimes don't ask. But I think that the harder question that's important to ask is why do we think these inequities persist? I think it's especially important to ask that question, not only of ourselves, but of the people who are resistant. Why the, is this happening? And let me tell you why I think it's a, it's a, it takes a little courage to ask that question. 
um, even even of ourselves. And this is a, this is potential for people of color. I think that one of the things we have to deal with is this internalized racism issue. And I think that part of what we have to face courageously is that given all that we're taught essentially about white superiority and given all that we see in terms of people's uh, communities, fate and access to resources that will help them, I think there's a part of us that lurks beneath that wonders whether we deserve that fate. Like, and I know I see that myself. Like, like um, um, when I go, this usually happens in Detroit a lot. When, uh, um, when I would go to stores, where like, like as we call them, party stores in Detroit, that, that and where like it clearly wasn't being managed well. The shelves, there were a lot of empty shelves. Like, there's a part of me that that did a narrative about um, black people and their capacity to own and run institutions. That thing came up for me and the subject's coming up for me. You know, now we can, you can come with strategies. Like I, sometimes I joke with friends, you, some situations happen not, that many people, um, I would not be surprised many people call it do this where you see some situation the, of some uh, person, black person acting in ways that you think are um, unsuitable, especially institutionally and there's a, we ain't ready for freedom. And then we, you joke about that, right? So my point is that, um, this issue of our people of color responsible for their degraded state, that lurks in the that lurks deeply in the American consciousness. And we are afraid of it. And the reason I'm saying to ask the question of why do these inequities persist is because I think that at the root of why we allow them to persist is because part of us thinks that people deserve what they're getting. And so by pushing us to ask the question, why is it trouble for us to uh, get a sufficient number of black staff? Why are these this persistent property happening? Why is that happening? Because at the root of some of that why, and the reason we allow it is a sense, I think in some people that maybe they deserve it. Maybe those people are inferior. And I think that part of what it's useful to do especially with a person of color who's subject to internalized racism is to start talking about that and to ask yourself that question and to surface that maybe, uh-oh, that maybe part of our, part of what's going on, part of what affects our behavior, part of what can limit our activity, our commitment to addressing these issues is this unease sense that this is how it's supposed to be. Ultimately, a core issue that lurks beneath those three questions that I said earlier, it's the other man versus brother man. Well, who is responsible for the state of the greatest state, the, un, the disparities of people of color? Who is responsible for that? Is it, is it, uh, is it, is it the other man or the brother man? And I think that Subconsciously, what we have to deal with is the fact that part of us can feel, even if a person of color can feel, it's the it's, it's us, and I think that it's important to surface that and asking hard questions like why is this persisting is an important part of grappling with that. So, I just had a little bit of courage asking my man about what he does. People didn't ask him that, and I'm just some little young. Right, first out of high school. Um, but when that moment came, with uh, at the at the town hall prep for town hall meeting, and is David going to be in his ear? And Grace quickly said, "The little pause." Quickly said, "No, I didn't push back. You know, I knew what I knew. I should have. I knew I should have. I didn't have the courage to do it. I didn't. I didn't say yes. I was." I was thrown, I was pushed back by her demeanor that I had seen and didn't, didn't want to mess with it. Now, I'm not sure that making a different choice would have changed the course of racial history, but I know that that whole town hall was a lot more boring than it would have been. Here's what the New York Times said about it. With an edgy impatience by his faulty demeanor, President Clinton struggled today to strike some sparks 
in this national conversation on race. The White House is anxious to avoid uh, Mr. Clinton's cherished race initiative, all this talking business, as he called it today, anxious to avoid it dissolving into banal chatter. And banal chatter is exactly what happened. And why did it happen? Because I didn't step forward to tell the other guy on stage, go to Herman now, go to Susie now. If I had been in his ear, that would have been better. And I knew that at that meeting, but I didn't have the courage to say it. I had the skill. I had put the people in the, I had put the people in the room. I knew what should happen. I had the skill, but I didn't have the will that I needed to. It's kind of like the opposite of me on the couch. Mama, I had the will, but no skill. And in each situation, a shift did not happen. And so part of what I'm trying to get y'all around is having the skills, which requires some storytelling, so I'm about to talk about, but also having the will. So <clears throat> one of the things we have to be willing to do is to ask a courageous question. A second thing that's important to do is to be able to make a strategic concession. Let me tell you about one. And, but the question that we have, the, 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 the bigger picture issue is, what are the concessions in these kind of conversations that we don't want to make? So when I was at Berkeley, my first foray into the whole dialogue business really was I was the co-facilitator of a course. And the course was basically 14 students, all five major ethnic groups, sitting around talking about racial issues, very little homework, a little bit of reading, some guest speakers, some little things to do out in the community, but it's mostly three hours of dialogue every week. And uh, one time, I did three semesters, one time there was a guy in there named Dirk, this kind of a red haired white dude, working class. This is at UC Berkeley, so everybody's a prestigious student, but the working class guy. Um, and um, there's mostly women, of course, but not only. And there was another dude named Russell, this black, this all-American football player. And so Dirk was, I mean, um, was clearly like of the mindset that, like, we're like he both signed up for the course. He almost came in to to, to make the point that we talk about race too much. Like he was, he was, he would be called equity resistant, right? We talk about race too much. I'll make it too big a deal out of these issues. If we just really as, operate as people, we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to, our life, our lives would be better. Why are we doing that? We're creating, we're creating more unfairness potentially. He had all of that. This was, this was around 1989. So the whole white privilege thing had, was just entering uh, the common lingo. Of course, people at Berkeley are a little forward. So they were talking about it a little bit. So he would get pushback from the uh, people of color in the class and, and he would get some co-signing of the other, other white women, but, uh, and some distance, but a lot and a lot of pushback from uh, the uh, people of color. So at one point, this kind of boiled, this, this built for a while. And at one point, it kind of uh, 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 got a little more heated than usual. And and he made the statement that he doesn't know. He he really is tired of all of this rhetoric from people telling him that he needs to like watch who he is and watch what he says and. Um, and not just be his natural self because he's affecting too many people. And you think that that's ridiculous. And that way, of, if we construct a world like that, it's going to cause a problem for everybody. So there was, you know, but it was, it was, there was more rhetoric and heat about that than usual. And so the, my facilitator, white man, he said, so Russell, you haven't said much. What do you think, Russell? Russell, no, Russell did not talk a lot in this class. He was in the class, talked some. He said, well, I, find, I do find uh, Dirk's perspective um, kind of irritating because it, 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 you know, we got to deal with the complexities of who we are all the time and how it goes down differently to different people and, and have to manage all that. And I, that, 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 and I don't know, so for him to actually say we shouldn't be doing that is ridiculous. That's just how it is. But I do understand why he doesn't want to do that because dealing with that is complicated. It's a headache. I wish I didn't have to deal with it all the time. The reason that, I mean, he said it a little differently, but here's the main point. The reason that I'm in a black fraternity is because I'm one sitting where I ain't got to deal with that. So 
although I find what he's saying irritating, I also get how he doesn't want to deal with that. He doesn't deal with that complication. I don't like that complication either. He made a concession that there was a cost to be paid and that it would be, it's understandable that somebody would resist that cost and not want to do that. By con making concession, he was like, huh, many things can be true here. And it kind of, it caused a shift in that conversation. Like people, the, the people of color were like, um, you know, most of whom created community for themselves around people of color. So they understood what Russell said about the fact that it's a relief to be in settings without that. And they, but then they kind of, they understood then they kind of got how we're inviting or pressuring Dirk to do something that we have to do that we don't like doing. So we can only be so angry at him for not wanting to do that. So I think that it's important as we're talking, talking to people who are racial equity skeptics, it's important to think through what are the concessions that it's important, it's useful to make. One of the things that I find as I'm trying to coach white folks about talking about racial issues, one of the things that I find is that <clears throat> one of the things that would be very effective when they're talking to racism skeptics, racial equity skeptics, is to make concessions around the idea that there's been racial progress. A lot of what happens is, is that people, um, our discourse on the left has made us highly resistant to admitting that there's been some domains of racial progress. We don't want to admit it because we think you, you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And so one of the things I think is important, uh, one of the things I coach people to do is to think about domains of racial progress that they have actually witnessed and have observed and have experienced and benefited from. And let me tell you one for me. So I lived, after I graduated from prison, I lived in New York City for four years before I went out to Berkeley. In New York City, in the 80s, there were three different times in which there were essentially mob lynchings of black men. Now, it wasn't a ritualized mob lynching that you see in the old timey picture, but it was times in which people who didn't know each other in the morning collaborated, people who collaborated in the death of a black man that they also didn't know by the, by the sundown. 82, 86, 89. I'm, I was there in 82 and 86. Now, the spontaneously forming white mob has been running for hundreds of years. My dad had to worry about it. His dad had to worry about it. His dad had to worry about it. We can go back. I had to worry about it as a young man in the 80s. The spontaneously forming lethal white mob does not run now. It doesn't run now. If it ran, we know about it. I'm not saying there's no hate crimes. Those people know each other, they're conspiring. I'm not saying police violence isn't a problem. That's its own other thing. But the spontaneously formed lethal white mob does not run now. And I think that that's, like, I feel the benefit of that. I feel freer to move about the country because I'm not worried about that. Like I used to be worried about that in the 80s. So I'm bringing that up to make the point about there are domains of racial progress that we can talk about, but that oftentimes we are resistant to talking about. Because we don't want to, we, we worry that talking about them will just feed and enable the denial. And I would offer that sometimes a strategic concession in a conversation helps you make your point. So uh, example, other examples of things we don't like to admit. Um, in addition to there's been domain, there's domains of racial progress that we can all be happy about and can talk about. Um, I think there's, there's, there's significant differences that, need, that can be noted between racism, racism denial, and racism ignorance. Now, are they all part of white supremacy? You can make that argument. The critical race theorists who have made a great contribution to American discourse would tell you that, but I think it is, there is also a difference and it's, it is useful to point out the difference especially when talking to somebody who doesn't believe all this anyway. It's, it, it is useful to, to acknowledge there's a difference between racism, racism denial, and racism ignorance. I think some of us are unlikely to do that. I think we're also unlikely to talk about um, 
moments when you remember when Dave Chappelle, when keeping it real goes wrong. I think it's we're unlikely to talk about when anti-racism goes wrong. What does that mean? That might mean are there times in which an accusation of racism, of race, the accusation of racism that might be against a person of color was actually inaccurate? Does that happen? Of course it happens. We don't like to talk about that. Are there times in which an anti an, um, an anti-racist remedy actually causes more problems than it fixes? I don't think that happens most of the time. I'm an anti-racist. I think we need more anti-racism efforts. Does that ever happen? Of course it happens. It's important to be able to talk about that. It's important to talk about that, especially to somebody who doesn't believe all of this. Strategic concessions are useful in trying to move people forward. So if you've ever witnessed or maybe even created an anti-racism remedy that went wrong or accused my racism and that was wrong, it might be useful to admit that if you're trying to move somebody forward. That kind of strategic concession can be very helpful. So I talked about asking a question. I talked about a strategic concession. I want to lastly talk about an honest confession. So a couple years ago, I was in Minnesota, Minneapolis, doing a, I was at a conference, I was doing a big keynote about unconscious bias. And um, something, something happened while I was there in the past couple of days, I was there, I was there for a couple of days. So, um, so if you've been in Minneapolis, you know that they have like these sky bridges that connect the, the, the buildings out down because it's too cold to go outside uh, in the winter. So I'm, I'm, I was doing what I should be doing now, I was getting my steps. I, I, I've, I've lost track of that, I should be back to that. I was trying to get my 10,000 steps in. So I'm just walking around almost randomly and I'm loving the fact that it's all connected. I ain't gotta go outside, right? And deal with the traffic and all that. It wasn't, it wasn't cold, but it was just, Lovely to be in that place with all stores around, et cetera. So I'm walking, walking, and then I pass this black guy. There's not too many black people, it's many Minneapolis. So I pass this black guy, he's younger, he's kind of sort of me, kind of thin, he kind of had that like Somali Eritrean look. I thought, you know, a lot of people like, like that in Minneapolis. So I kind of catch his eye trying to do that nod business. And he didn't, he totally looked at me, but not really, he did not. And I saw so my eyes kind of tracked him a little bit. And I noticed he had like an empty backpack. Eh, eh, he has a backpack, it doesn't look anything in it. So, he, so we passed by, okay, whatever. So I'm, do, I'm walking more, I make some random turn. Uh, for some reason, I like I turn back and look at something. I noticed that he's walking my direction now. He's walking the same direction as me. So oh, that's interesting. That, why is that? That, that was funny, he went the other direction. Hmm, okay. So I'm walking more, walking more, make another turn. And uh, then uh, some point I'm looking at various things. I, look, I noticed that he's behind me again. So part of me is like, what is this dude doing behind me? So, um, okay, I need to keep track of this. I don't know what's, what's, what's up with that. That's, that's odd. Somebody would, I'm making random things and he's, he's behind me now. So I go and I make one more turn and the dude is still behind me. And I'm like, wait a minute now. Why is this Somali terrorist following me? What's, it, what, what's he doing with the backpack? Is he going? Is he going to rob me? And that's that's his loot bag. What is up with that? Like I'm going through all this stuff, and I decide, okay, David, calm down. All you can do, you you you're from Detroit, you can handle this. You're gonna take invasive maneuvers. So I pull over to the side, take out my phone. Like I'm checking my messages. I ain't got no messages. I'm checking my phone to watch the Somali terrorists go by. He goes by. Done not done, done acknowledge me again. He goes by, and on the same block he turns into like this little luggage kiosk, this luggage repair place. And he's like a big greeting with this other smiley looking dude. And it's like, oh, I'm up there, whatever they're saying. And then he takes out his backpack. He clearly has brought his backpack there to be fixed. So then I'm thinking, what, <laughs> what am I doing? Like I'm, I have criminalized this young dude who I could take out, um, unless he had his AK going crazy like that. I, I could clearly handle this dude. I've turned him into some sort of person who he is not for no reason other than he is a black guy and, may, and maybe looks like he's from that part of Africa. I've criminalized him the way that I have been criminalized myself. So when I told, when I, so I'm there to do some kind of bias thing and this had just happened. So I told this story in the presentation about, and it was talking about the pervasiveness of bias. And so <clears throat> I was there for a couple of days. I had meeting with the big group and then with the board. 
And so uh, at the meeting with the board, the, 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 the vice chair of the board took me aside. He said, you know, I really appreciate you telling me that story because I haven't really been fully on board with all of this like equity diversity business, but you're telling me that made me think maybe I do have that. Cause, cause in the, in the general meeting, I had asked the question like a using polling, have you ever um, had racy bias thoughts you're not proud of? And he is like 2% of people said, no, he said, I was one of the 2% of the people who said no, but you know, I think I have had that. And I really appreciate you telling me that. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because sometimes the confession, the honest confession can cause a shift. So just like I was talking earlier about the internalized uh, oppression that um, uh, white folks that people of color can have, and it's useful to lift that up and start asking why, I'm especially telling white folks, but anybody, we're all subject to white superiority thinking, hashtag we all have the virus, um, that it is important to start confessing that we have these thoughts and feelings. Even Max Kennedy says that the heart of racism is denial and the heart of anti-racism is confession. So he's right on the money on that. The most important thing you can do to try to persuade somebody who's in denial about racism in the world is to talk about the racism within you that sometimes comes out. And that is a vulnerable place to go. We're ashamed of it. We don't like having those thoughts. We like to think we put it behind us. We all woke now. Yes, yes, yes. And we need to define that wokeness as involving confessing to those moments in which we are the opposite of woke. Maybe we're woke enough to recognize it, but we're, we're maybe never will be woke enough to never have these thoughts. So my invitation to you is to start telling these stories in the context of trying to be persuasive that go to a higher level of disclosure and vulnerability and risk. My invitation to you is that if you want to move your organization forward, you need to make some new decisions about how you had these conversations. You do not have to be eight-year-old David with a will, but no skill. You don't have to be David the White House with a skill, but no will. My invitation is for you to say, I have both the skill. I just gave you the skills. Question, concession, confession. You have the skills to do that. You have to decide whether you have the will to do that. And here is the good news. You can start today. You can start today, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, on the confession part. You're around other people who are into racial equity. So asking hard questions, that might be what y'all are doing. Teaching concessions, maybe that's really necessary, but I think that the confession part is something y'all can do starting today or when you get home tonight, or, uh, maybe y'all at home right now, when you see your family members at night. We need to practice the muscle of making these confessions. Question and concession too, but I think the most important of any of those are the confessions. You can start practicing today to get more comfortable telling these stories which can cause transformation. So I wanna invite you to do that starting today. So I have not been tracking the chat or anything else. I've been talking to y'all. So I am happy to answer some questions if there are any. And I really enjoyed my chance to talk to you today. David, thank you so much. This is such a powerful beginning to the conversation in, in this conference, but um, I've been trying to scroll through the chat, seeing more by way of comments um, about how appreciative people are uh, and just affirm affirmation of, of what you've said, um, much needed conversation, um, 
uh, there was a link to the um, the Harvard University bias test. Um, oh yeah, project implicit. That yes. thing is awesome. It's awesome for you. It's awesome for the racial equity skeptics in your life. You should take it first. So you come into that invitation having done it yourself. Um, some, someone else just asked, if, if Swan can re repost the Harvard link, um, somebody's asking for it again. Um, maybe, I, I'm not sure if you can do this in, in a short conversation, but I know you, I've seen you on TV talking about how to have conversations with your relatives over the holidays. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you can touch on that at all, because sure. sometimes those are the hardest conversations to have. Okay, so first, yes. So let me just tell you. So first, I actually, I actually have a video course on this very topic. It's called the Holiday Survive and Thrive Guide. So if you go to thedialoguecompany.com, you can get a there's a there's a video course precisely on this topic. Because I know a lot of folks struggling with that. Of course, it's mostly white folks because it's white folks who are more split ideologically, right? But it's not only them. So. Um, here is what I would, um, here's, here's my uh, quick answer to that question. So an important skill to develop, I mean, I, I kind of went in order. Like, like I just say the like, question, concession, confession, that's part of what I teach to people as a conversation management strategy called the RACE method. And RACE stands for reflect, ask, connect, expand. And so reflect means calm down. Right. Get ready for the conversation. Get find your find your wusa, find your centering place to go to for these conversations. Reflect, ask, ask questions. Now, in this case, in that case, what I'm talking about, not not institutionally, I'm saying the questions you want to ask are about people's experience that is producing their belief. So you have some you have some ideological gap. What you want to do is to try to get people not talking about their belief, but their experiences beneath their belief by asking an experience question or more than one to get them talking about their experiences that are driving their belief. Reflect, ask, connect. Try to find something you can line up with with what they say. Basically, you remember the ABC principle. Um, uh, agreement before challenges. I just wrote an article. If, you're, if you guys are on LinkedIn, um, uh, you, if you can find me. I just wrote an article. Um, God, I got to remember that. It, it's, uh, if you look me up on LinkedIn, you will find this article. I just, is, I, there's a woman has a column named Victoria Taylor. And I just wrote an article that embodies some of this. But in any case, my point is, is that um, reflect, calm down, ask, ask questions about their experience, connect, find something that you can agree with that's at least adjacent to what they said. So you want to you teach them that your experience has some value for them and doesn't require them to make a complete shift. So the classic example of that is somebody is in denial about uh, whether there's uh, law enforcement there's racism in law enforcement, you know, you know, if you just act right, everybody gets treated fairly. Now, you don't believe that, but you do believe that there are good cops out there. So once you, so you ask them a question, they say, well, why do you think that? And they tell you some story that showed that illustrates to them why that's true. So what do you do? You, t you find something to connect with. You, you, you connect with what's adjacent to what they said, which is, there are good cops out there. So you probably have a good cop story. Even if you have a whole bunch of bad cop stories, you have a good cop story. Tell that good cop story. What does that do? That trains them to see your, your experiences as something that has value for them. You do that. You agree before challenging, before you tell them a story that is the reason why you think racism is real. So what you're trying to do in that sequence is to try to turn a debate into a dialogue. You're trying to not have a body, uh, knocking of heads around beliefs, but having an exchange about experiences and what do we make of our experiences? If you are, if you really get momentum going, this is really rare. You can think of it as a, you, you get them to talk about some experiences that reinforce what you said. You can think of it as a two by two matrix. They talk about experiences that reinforce their belief. You talk about experiences that enforce their belief, reinforce their belief. You talk about experiences that reinforce your belief. And again, this rarely happens, but it does happen sometimes. Get them to talk about experiences that reinforce your belief. Now you're in a dialogue about the nature of our experiences, the nature of the truth. But if you just do the first three, that's following the race method, you will have a much better <laughs> exchange and a much better uh, reconciliation behind that horrible Thanksgiving dinner y'all had uh, 
uh, than if you just have another conversation about your beliefs. Thank you. Um, there was, we have time for a couple more questions and I'm looking for the one, um, okay. Uh, do you make do you make any distinction between racism and prejudice? Uh, sure. I mean, I think that, that so. Um, so here's what I want to say. I think that I think that precision is important, but I also think that one of the things that people uh, people on the left often do is to overly focus on like getting people to sign up for definitions. And you, you can waste conversational energy around trying to force people having the right definition when you really need to be talking about, you need to spend your conversational time on what are people's experiences of the world. So let me just say that as a general piece of advice, I've seen so many people waste good conversational time on trying to enforce uh, essentially left-wing definitions of racism, which are accurate and, and reasonable, as opposed to really having a conversation about what are our experiences of the world. Okay, so, but as a general matter on that, I would say like prejudice is like, prejudice is held by a person and it's about like, it's the manifestation of bias on principally on a racial basis but maybe other prejudices too. Whereas racism includes that, but also it has to do with like how systems function and it's a much bigger, it's a much bigger idea because it, it, it includes, potentially it includes those structural issues that are part, remember the part of that separate question, the, the, the uh, structures of the past affect the present? Well, of, of course the answer is, my answer is yes. And the, the complex way that does that is in the realm of racism that's beyond prejudice. But just to be clear, that's a, it's a, it, this is an important conversation to have when you are talking to people who b basically believe racism is a problem, but be careful of overly focus on definitions when you talk about racism, talking about racism with people who don't think it's a problem, because that is a that can be a fool's errand to get you away from the transformative conversation that's possible. Thank you, and uh, I think one more before we uh, uh, move uh, your videos off again. I don't know if that's deliberate. Ooh, video. Well, let's fix that. <laughs> there you Aha! go. Um, the okay. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the spontaneous lethal white mob. You said that you don't need to worry about that anymore. How did it go away? Wondering if there could be a connection to dealing with the police brutality problem. I think it went away because of uh, uh, three MJs and a BC. I think that thing went away because of Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, uh, and Michael Jackson. I think that I think that the, prep, the promise of those people, and of course Bill Cosby, I think the promise of those people in the 80s was significantly responsible for uh, the, the diminution and the erasure of the spontaneously forming white mob. It, it is difficult to, 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 to those, those, the presence of those people culturally made it harder to maintain the sort of background level of white resentment of black people that used to exist, that could just, just erupt and erupt in those lynchings I talked about. So, uh, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not a cultural critic. That's my armchair analysis of that. I'm just saying, and there, I'm undoubtedly other forces. But my, my point is, is that, um, I, I think there was a big shift in the 80s, and I think those four people were had a big role to play in that. So, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, the, the, the people who were doing that before didn't have posters of people, didn't have posters of black heroes on their walls when they were teenagers, right? Whereas when, once that started to shift, it's gonna be, it's gonna be harder to, to maintain that generalized level of background hatred that used to exist. So the other question was, what's that have to do with police? Is that, was that the second half of that question? If, if there were lessons to be learned that could help address the police brutality problem, if, if the oh, white- well, I, I, um, I, I think that, I, I, um, I'm not sure I think it's a cultural shift issue. I think that the, I think that police brutality issue is, I mean, one of the things that's starting to happen now, and here's, another, here's a sign of racial progress. Like even 10 years ago, it was really rare that policemen like got convicted for murdering black people unnecessarily. That don't happen nearly as much as it should now, but it does happen now occasionally but i think that the um i think that the the police abuse problem I, I i'm not sure how related they are because i think that the other shift happened because of big cultural forces i think that the police abuse problem the, the core things that happen are consequences and training so that there's an expectation and of course there's, there's also police cultural issues right so if a if police chiefs say that not only are there there are legal consequences that that's possible. They don't even control that that much. 
but they do control um, how acceptable these things are found. And of course, there's also there's always it's, it's a, a citizen oversight. Those structures that make it you can't just get away with that. Like that that's what saw right on George Floyd. This dude thought he could just get away with it, or I don't know what he was thinking, but um, you know, he would have gotten away with it in 1978. But now you know we'll see what happens with him. But he's 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 on charges, and that wouldn't have happened in my lifetime, most likely. But I'm I am not sure that the shift that happened culturally. Um, there's big um, examples. There's big carryover. I think that the police, the police who are subject to the abuse thing now, it's a it's a deeper issue. Those, those people, those people got black heroes. At least some, not now. There is a whole authoritarian undertone among police officers generally and amongst the American public. So that's true. But I'm just saying a whole bunch of people who do that police abuse thing, um, it's are not the classic haters that still exist. But a whole bunch of people are. It's it's a different issue. It's more around. Uh, some combination of bias and not thinking there's consequences. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we are out of time. There was a great question, but I, I don't know that it could be answered in, in a very. Oh, we'll quick... say the question. I, 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 you won't answer it. I'll give you the quickest answer possible. It's a great. It's question. a great question. So, um, it, it, it's. Can you share a few more ideas about how we all have the virus? How we were all infected by white dominant culture and racial bias. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, that cannot be answered quickly. So, <laughs> but if anybody, how about this? Um, uh, you know, another thing I was thinking about doing, and uh, I didn't have time to do it, is to put my little examples that I said. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, uh, I'm gonna type them up and clean that up. So just and and and, and um, I'm, it's not gonna be full references, but just gonna be some examples so you can just like break out. So you can just have as a cheat sheet. So I will give you that, um, but I think that um, which I want to invite you to. There's a whole bunch of books about bias, and one of them, one of the more interesting ones, is a book called Biased by J Jennifer Everhart. She's a famous. She's a. Um, uh, I mean, there's many books about this. So I would invite you to read those or any of them. Look on Amazon, which is the most popular. I think it's. I think that becoming familiar with these things is important to do. Uh, so I, 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 you're right. I cannot say these examples quickly, but um, but I, I will get to you, Linda. I'll get you that. Uh, cheat sheet for distribution, um, or, or I might put it on my website and then you can send the link to it to people. I'll be happy to do that. That would be awesome. Um, David, I cannot thank you enough on behalf of uh, people who are waving and applauding in the chat room. And, Ooh, and look at that, yay! <laughs> you like waving and applauding. <laughs> yes. Um, so, and, and like the even better news, of course, is that we get to see you again tomorrow to moderate the uh, philanthropy and nonprofit panel. So uh, thank you again for, for all of this, for uh, providing such a powerful frame for the rest of the conference and, and how we're approaching the rest of these conversations. Um, so a lot to well, do. Thank but... you. And I appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, look forward to tomorrow. We're going to do it one more again, as they say. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay, that was quite amazing um, and so much to think about and, and so much to do and so much to build from uh, and great, great comments in the chat. We will save that as well so we can share that with, uh, with people. Uh, remember this uh, session has been recorded so we'll have a link to that when, uh, when we are able uh, shortly after the conference. Um, we are, uh, we do have some time before the break and some important things to share as well. At various points during the conference, we are going to be showing videos from uh, funders, from our members, from others highlighting the important work that's going on as we grapple with a number of issues. Uh, so I wanted to start with uh, two from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, I think you all know who Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is, but they are, uh, Obviously, they, they've been taking such a leadership role in promoting a culture of health, in promoting equity, um, and, and they're such a, a force uh, nationally and internationally, and we're very fortunate that they're in New Jersey. So they shared a couple of videos with us that I would like to share with you. So bear with me.
Across New Jersey, your work as nonprofit leaders, volunteers, and community champions is making an enormous difference in the lives of our neighbors here in the Garden State. I applaud you for the heart and determination you've displayed as our families and communities endured the worst public health crisis in the century while addressing deep social injustices, including the legacy of structural racism in our society. Make no mistake, this is hard and stressful work, and I want you to know how much you are appreciated. Your work sparks hope and inspiration every day. What you're doing will help New Jersey to weather the storm and recover in a way that allows us to merge as a healthier and more equitable state. Again, thank you for all that you do in our communities every day. May God bless you. Our thanks to Maisha Simmons of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who is the head of the New Jersey program um, for her message of thanks to the nonprofit community. Before I get into housekeeping, I do wanna keep the good vibes going. So bear with me because you might not have seen it, but before the Thanksgiving break, Senator Cory Booker posted a fantastic video thanking nonprofits for their extraordinary work. And what I would like to do here is pull that up for you. Hi, it's United States Senator Cory Booker. And in this season of Thanksgiving, I want to thank you personally for your incredible commitment, heroic work during this pandemic. But in these dark times, you all are light workers. You are standing up and being there for others. You are putting yourselves and your families even at risk as you go and help others make it through. Gosh, and I want to thank the staff and volunteers working at nonprofits and those serving those in need during this crisis across New Jersey. Your heroism, your willingness to be out there serving others, standing for others, putting at times your own life at risk. I am so grateful that you all have continued to be there for others, for our state, helping us to endure this very difficult and challenging time. For all that you do, words are not enough, but I hope during this time of Thanksgiving, you feel the spirit of a grateful state, a grateful nation. You are the reason why we are enduring these challenges and why I know, no matter how difficult it gets in these coming weeks and months ahead, that we shall overcome. Thank you for being heroes and for living your patriotism through your selfless actions. God bless you and happy Thanksgiving. So before we go on our break, I'm just going to provide a little bit more housekeeping. Just by way of a reminder to access the sessions for today, uh, you can visit the link that is on this screen that we will put in the chat box. This is also sent to you, uh, or access to all of the session links was sent to you in your email. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can access the, uh, the program for this afternoon. We will be going into a break at uh, until 12 o'clock, so refresh your coffee, grab something to eat, uh, visit the exhibitors, visit with each other, talk about David Camp's amazing presentation and what that means to you and how that resonates with your work. Um, so much more to talk about, so much more to do. Uh, if you have not downloaded the Whova app, there is still time to do that, and it's a great way to engage with uh, your uh, fellow attendees and with us. So let's take a break and uh, we will post uh, a screen uh, so that you can see some other information about the center and about navigating the conference and uh, also appreciating all who have been supporting this event and our work. So we will break for uh, a little bit over an hour and again, connect with people, but we will reconvene in the lunch networking sessions at 12 o'clock.
The ARC's mission, and this is a mission that's throughout the country, is to empower people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to live a full and active life in the community. Whatever their particular life dreams are, really support them to be included as valued members of society. A real challenge to uh, ensure that the community understands what inclusion is. And inclusion means everyone has the right to a full and active life.